we had any volume in here. We do have volume in here. I'm Jared Longsign. I think most of you know who I am. There may be some who don't. I'm glad I get to finally see Faye. I, I did not put, I was like, I know that Faye's from somewhere. Of course I know. She's a missionary sent from, or supported by here for years, right? So uh, that's great. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to see her. Uh, I'm just, I'm glad to be here today. Um, I feel nervous. There's a camera on me, and I know that I'm going to be on YouTube, and I'll further my YouTube celebrity status. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll be going to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to be, I'm just going to give you the three points because they're alliterated, and when you alliterate a message, you feel like you're a much better preacher, Rick, and I'm really excited about that. So we're going to talk about falsehoods, fullness, and a finished work. Falsehoods fullness, and a finished work. So, one of the important things that we need to establish whenever we're going into a section of scripture is to understand why it was written, and who it's written to, and all those types of things. So, who wrote the epistle to the church of Colossae? Anyone know who wrote it? Or who penned it? So, the Holy Spirit inspired it, so all scripture is given by inspiration to God, and so we know that Paul's the one that penned it. Holy Spirit inspired it. So why was it written? Why was the book of Colossians, why is, it, why is that epistle written? Ooh, good question. So we'll get to that. So let me uh, start out by this. You discover that you were always whole, always complete, and never lacking on your own. Two. You find that your wholeness means realizing how incredibly strong you are. I hope this is making you feel uncomfortable. Three, now that you have focused on your own identity and self-worth, you are able to seek those answers within yourself. Four, you understand that you deserve love from others, yes, but most importantly, from yourself. Five, you find what drives you and spend your time in selfish pursuit of it. And six... You appreciate yourself for the imperfect, complex, and astounding being you are. Discovering your wholeness means falling in love with yourself. It means seeing for the first time how incredible you are. All right, anyone see anything wrong with those things that I just said? Yes, I hope so, right? Can anyone tell me what's wrong with some of those things? You're all about yourself, right? So what's wrong with you? <laughs> Uh, anyone have any answer? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Number one, you're a sinner. You're rotten. You're terrible. You're about as bad as it could be. Loving yourself is a real problem, right? Because because what are you really loving about yourself? It's all about loving who? God, right? And then loving other people. Because naturally we already love ourselves. Do we need to tell ourselves to love ourselves anymore? We need to be told that we need to love God more. So secondly is when you're looking to yourself for the answers, what's the problem with that? You'll fail, fail, right? It's limited. Can I just say the answers within yourself are limited. So I got saved, many of you know this, when when I was an adult. I got saved when I was 23. When I was 23 years old, before I got saved, I thought I was one of the wisest, smartest people I'd ever met. Then you get saved, and you start hanging out with Christians, and you find out that your wisdom really isn't all that wise. Because what you found out is, all these people, what they do, is they go where? To the scripture. And what do you find out about yourself when you freshly get saved? You don't know as much as you think you know. And so the answers to life aren't within yourself. The answers to life are found in the Bible. And we find that we have fullness in Jesus Christ. And we find out that we have a finished work in Him. And so this thing that I read to you was found on the internet. And I just wanted to find out what fullness was or one of these searches on Google. And you'll find a million answers about how you can love yourself better. How you can find answers within yourself. And how that you can be a more complete person by just simply looking in yourself. And really that that's that's not true. Um, I was trying to think of a better, uh, a better phrase, but I just want to say it's just not true. Everything we have is within Christ. 
So what does it mean to be whole? Where do you find it? And for most of the world, they look and they look and they cannot find it. For many Christians, we find Jesus and then we try to add other things to him. So even for the Christian, once we find Jesus Christ, we take him and add something to him. Now I understand we're in a Bible-believing church right now, but there's many people out there that espouse that they're Christians, but then they keep adding things to Jesus Christ. They have Jesus and then keep adding things to it. And I just want to say that everything you need, everything that you truly, really want to desire spiritually is in Jesus Christ. And so in Colossians, Paul is writing to fend off an apostate teaching. And the teaching is called Gnosticism. And so he's trying to push away these Gnostics. And Gnosticism is a scourge that's hard to identify and hard to extinguish. Today, Gnosticism is interwoven with Eastern religions. It's interwoven with yoga and Mormonism and so much more. And people are consumed, even in churches, even in churches, with finding more to life outside of Christ. First, let's define Gnosticism. And it's perhaps the most dangerous heresy that threatens the early church, and it certainly threatens the church today. Uh, And we get to see those influenced even by philosophers such as Plato. So Gnosticism is based on two false premises. First, it espouses dualism. And the dualism is regarding spirit and matter. And the idea is this in Gnosticism, that the body, it's evil. This physical being I have is evil, but the spirit is good. And so you go, oh man, oh, this is already hurting my head, right? But the idea is that your flesh is inherently evil, but the spirit is good. Now, what do you know about your own spirit? It's rotten, right? It's rotten, it's rotten, it's rotten, it's rotten. And we know that we're spiritually dead. But Gnostics asserted that your body is inherently evil, but the spirit is inherently good. And second, Gnostics claim to possess an elevated knowledge, a higher truth known to only a certain few. Now, what do we know about truth? It's available to everybody. The simple, the genius, the poor, the rich... Black, white, yellow, it doesn't matter. Truth is available to all people, and all people can know truth. In fact, truth can be known to the ones that went went over in that little room. My little eight-year-old can know truth. The five-year-old can know truth. And truth is available to everybody. Where Gnostics say it's only available to a few certain people. Have you ever heard when you're talking to somebody about, uh, about Christianity or about other religions, or about goofy doctrines in Christianity that you just don't understand. I mean, I've heard it. You just don't understand. If you knew like I did, then you'd fully understand. The truth is very simple in Christianity. And so when we're looking here, we're going to find out that whether Gnosticism is wrapped up in in the first century Adams or today, we can know for sure how to know Jesus Christ. We can know for sure how to get to heaven. We can know for sure all sorts of truths. And so if Christianity were something to be achieved, if Christianity was something that was only for a few, we'd have a problem. But the good news is it's for everybody. So this lesson is going to focus less on Gnosticism and more focus on what we have in Jesus Christ. We have wholeness that doesn't exist anywhere in this world. And so there's three points, and the first one is falsehoods, then fullness, and a finished work. So in Colossians 2, we're going to read verses 8 through 10. If you're not already there, you should be. In verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So first of all, the falsehoods. You get to see that it starts with what word? Verse 8 starts with what word? Beware. Beware. It means what? Look out! It's like when you get the... The audience van, they're sitting on the road, and they're sitting right on the shoulder... And it says, the end of the world is near, the end of the world is near, or the end is near, the end is near, and people keep driving by. Ah, you're crazy, you're crazy, and people just drive by one after another, one after another, and what did it turn out? That the road was out, and they kept driving off the cliff, right? The end end is near. So, 
So when we say beware, we mean, look out. You've got to keep your head on a swivel. You have to be aware of this. And so when we see Scripture written in this first century, can we just say it applies to us too? The greatest thing about Scripture is it's just as relevant today as when it was written 2,000 years ago. And so beware. Beware. And the first thing you're supposed to be aware of is philosophy and vain deceits. The philosophy, the word philosophy is a combination of two Greek words which mean love and wisdom. And although we ought to love wisdom, however, we ought to love godly wisdom. And here the context is that of worldly wisdom. Is there a difference between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom? Surely there is. And so we have to make sure that we're able to discern between the two. You have to discern between the two. Vain deceit is, is an empty seducing. Mixing that worldly philosophy and emptiness of vain deceit will spoil you. You will be spoiled. Do you ever see people that get too smart for their own good? Now, can you spend all day studying this and only scratch the surface? You know, how long could you study John 3.16 before it get boring and tired? You could take each word in John 3.16 and spend a long time on it. Because of the meaning of Scripture, you can keep digging and digging and digging. And so when you come to studying the Bible, man, it's worth something. It's profitable to study. It helps you to be a better student of it. But people get bored with the Bible, don't they? And so they start studying things that are outside the Bible. And when you start studying things that are outside of Scripture, there's an emptiness to it. There's something that isn't fulfilling about Scripture. And so you must always go back to Scripture and don't spend your time on vain, uh, vain deceit. Don't spend your time on vain philosophy, as it were. And so not only that, we get to see the tradition of men. Now, do we have any traditions in this church? Oh, man. Anyone want to name any as long as pastor isn't here? Do we have an order of service? What happens, Dan, if you screw up the order of service? Everyone's confused. I was at, I was at Wildwood, and I was uh, Pastor Brennanstall was gone, and I'm leading the service and I had the people sit down for the second song, and you should have saw it. It was, you could just feel the air coming out of the room. We never sit while we sing. And it killed everybody. But we have an order of service. We have a way we do things. And this church does things a certain way. And if you didn't do the creak for your birthday box, he would have been... Ichabod. Ichabod would have been written on his forehead and they would have known that God had departed from him. <laughs> and so we have other traditions. We start church here at 10.05 or 10.06 or whatever it is, or 9.06 or whatever it is, 11.06. And so we see that there's all sorts of traditions built into what we do. Now, are, are traditions bad? No, it's fine, Right? But we have to make sure that tradition doesn't elevate itself to the level of Scripture. And so when we look at other religions, there's some, like Roman Catholicism, that'll say what? That Scripture is on the same level as the traditions of the elders and Papal Bull. And never mind, we won't go too far down that path, but the idea is we see that there's some religions that'll elevate tradition to the level of Scripture or bring down Scripture to the level of traditions and that's wrong and so when we see traditions of men here we get to see that it's not referring to what time they started started the saturday services for their synagogue or whether or not they had to order a service the traditions here was noted by josephus as the tradition of the elders or that the pharisees were more desirable than the word of the prophets and whether or not you look at judaism and you get to see how they elevated the Talmud and the Mishnah and other rabbinic teachings. Or whether or not you look at all these religions out there, all these sects of Christianity, and you get to see how they elevate their traditions. That's all wrong. And the traditions of men, and the tradition of elders, these traditions better not elevate themselves to the level of Scripture or bring Scripture down. Scripture always supersedes uh, what men believe. And what do we find out? We find that the Bible isn't our final authority, it's our only authority. If I say something that's contrary to Scripture, who do you believe? The Bible, every single time. Your pastor, every week, 
is going to be burdened with providing you guys truth. And you see that anyone who gets behind this pulpit is going to be burdened with bringing you truth from the scripture, not the traditions. I don't sit here and go, well, you know what Spurgeon said, so it must be true. Spurgeon is only correct as he goes after scripture. I'm only correct only, after I, only as I go after scripture. And I'm saying it's always the Bible first and not the traditions of men. Traditions should have their right, rightful place, but the traditions of man have their right place in the garbage can. And then the rudiments of men, or the rudiments of this world. Rudiments here deals with the world, earth, wind, fire, and water. The term is talking about those who are, this term is being used to a Greek speaker, and the vocabulary is religious astrology. And it's used as the religious astrology of that day. So should we follow astrology? No, please say no. Anyway, um, if someone said, I'm a Scorpio or whatever, I'm like, no, 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 anyway. This was astrology, as it were, and a number of occult type of things that go with it. And we ought to avoid paganism in any form. The fact that this teaching was after the paganism of this world, and it was not after Christ. And so even today, and I know we're talking about a Bible-believing church here, but there's churches within this state, probably within this community, that teach paganism within their own church. Now, I'm not going to sit here and talk about yoga all day, but you know there's churches that introduce yoga into their own churches. It's wrong. It's wrong. You ought not to be adding those types of things into your own church services. And so, I know we're like, well, that's not a big deal. I'm telling you, it's out there, and you need to keep your head about yourself, or it's going to start creeping into any other church. So not only are we looking at these falses, look at, let's look at the fullness. The contrast to the last verse is in this verse. If there are traditions, vain deceit, and rudiments that push people away from Christ into something else, it is to push people away from the sublime to the subpar. So in Christ we have fullness. And to push them away from anything as Jesus Christ is not as good. Jesus Christ is sublime. He's the pinnacle. He's the greatest there is. The moment you accepted Jesus Christ, that was the best moment in your life. I love listening to young people, <laughs> even Christians. Today, I married my best friend, and I love this person. They're the best thing that ever happened to me. Today, the day that I got married, it's the greatest day of my life. Excuse me? My greatest day was the day I accepted Jesus Christ my Savior. The greatest day was not the day I married my wife. It's right up there. It's top 20, top 30, but... <laughs> The day I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior is greater than the day I asked her to marry me. It was greater than the day that she said I do. It was greater than all that. And I love being married. And I love my wife. And I think she's wonderful. And I believe that our marriage is an example of what Christ and the church is. But, but, it nowhere near compares to what we have in him. And so anytime you see these people, hey, go after the rudiments of the world, go after philosophy, go after vain deceits, that takes you away from what's the best and moves you on to a second tier. Who would you rather have a good relationship with? Jesus Christ or the world? All about Jesus Christ. For in him, the Bible says, for in him. While Jesus is certainly a who, this is not just about a man. This is a destination for in him. The place we should all want to go, more than Disneyland, more than a national park, more than a stadium, the desire of us should be always pointed towards him. For in him is everything we should want and everything we need. Who likes going to Walmart? I saw someone, a couple of people raise their hand. I know, the people watching there is great. Anyway, um, and why do we go to Walmart besides people watching? Because they got a lot of stuff. Yes, Faye. And I know this. As a pastor, when I see someone I know, I run to the next aisle. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, they're here. You got to run. See, Tim's already running. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, when we go to Walmart, we go there because you can get a bunch of things at once. It's not like I'm going to go to the car park place and pick up some oil and then I'm going to go to the 
grocery store and pick up groceries there and then I'm going to run to the general goods section. Like We put it all in one place because at Walmart we can get everything, right? You can get clothes, you can get this, you can get that. And when you go to Target, you pay extra money to get the same thing so you can avoid the people that you'd see at Walmart. And (laughs) it's true, think about that. But in Christ... You go to him because he has everything you need, everything you desire, everything you want is in him. For in him, for in him dwells what? The fullness. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's full. Everything you need in terms of of a spiritual life is in him. So where do people go? Have you heard the term meditation being used? And they're not talking about the Christian version of meditation. I meditate an hour every day. I spend time in my spiritual happy place. And you hear all sorts of people being spiritual. But in Christ, you have everything you need in terms of spirituality. In Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. Wow, what a great thing. What a great thing. And so the Gnostics, they believe the word fullness, and it's, it's a funny use of the word because Paul's writing it, They knew that they believed that this fullness is the destination of their journey. The short of it is how they progressed in knowledge of God. However, you see that for the Gnostic, they were achieving spiritual life. But Paul said, look, it's not an achieving. It's not nirvana. It's not this Eastern religion stuff. It's all about Jesus Christ. The fullness doesn't dwell in a religion. Fullness is in a man, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fullness of God, and that fullness dwells continually and permanently in him bodily. Once again, the Gnostics believe only the spiritual is good, but Christianity says that our Jesus Christ, he resurrected what? Physically, not just spiritually. And we see that he says bodily. Once again, Paul refuted the Gnostic doctrine that matter was evil, and that Jesus did not have a human body. Jesus is greater than Gnosticism, and Jesus Christ is better than what the world offers In him dwells the Godhead. So let's talk about the finished work for a bit. If in him all fullness dwells, and in him the source of our hope and salvation, then that means the substance he provides must be great. The most precious thing you can have is in Jesus Christ. You are complete in him. Let's look at that verse again. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all, all principality and power. Think about that for a moment. What can you add to what you are in Him? What can you add to what you are in Him? We do not have a full appreciation of what we have in our possession. Um, I've said this recently to one of my friends, and he's got a really great wife, and I, I think I have a great wife. I don't fully appreciate what I have in my wife. Like, to be married to a bad wife is to have a very long life. Bud's probably been really blessed for the last 55 years, right? To be married to a good wife is, is a treasure. And I'm glad for what I have, and I, and I don't always appreciate that. But how much more so in terms of what I have in Jesus Christ and how much I appreciate that. What I have in Jesus Christ is fulfilling. The primary title of Christian is sufficient. The primary title of Christian should be the goal of every human. It isn't achieved, it's given. The only thing a title can give us is to add to the word Christian. For example, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a pastor, I'm a brother, I'm a son, and all those things are wonderful, right? But to add to that, I'm a Christian father, I'm a Christian brother, I'm a Christian husband, I'm a Christian. It's the title Christian that makes things sweet. Because all those other titles could go away, couldn't they? If I never got married and I was still a Christian, life would be complete. If we're never able to have children in our lives, but I had Christ, that would be a complete life. If you took away all my other titles and you just loved Christian, I would have a complete life. And there's so many people out there searching for other titles. The only one to be consumed with is Christian. And in fact... God could take all those things away and life would still be sweet. And so many people are looking to add to that. 
When we feel a lack of something in our lives, we must fight the urge to look somewhere else. It's like looking at the 22-year-old who thinks they're never going to get married. Oh, I'm, not gonna get, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to get married. It's never going to happen. And what do they do? They choose second best. They choose second best. And when you choose second best, your life ends up being second class. You'd better off not being married and have Jesus Christ than be married to the wrong person and then just struggling to keep that Christian relationship. Your life is sweet and full when you have Jesus Christ and that finished work you're completing Him is a big deal. And so many people fight against that. What is it? What is it that you look to when you're down, when you're scared? Where do you look? If I have a problem and I'm going through a struggle in my life, who do I naturally go to first? I should go to Jesus. Where do I actually go? Scott Pastor. No, um, Scott, help me out. I need money. Um, I go to my wife. That's why he doesn't return my text anymore. No, anyway, uh, wrong number. Um, I go to my wife. Becca, I'm having a problem. Help me out. If I got a car problem, who do I go to first? YouTube. No, uh, Jim. I go to Jim Salstrom. <laughs> you might go to your pastor first. You might go to whatever first. But who should be the front line? Who should be the first person you go to? The person Jesus Christ. Ask him. Ask him for wisdom and a decision. Ask him to give you direction. Because we know, go to James real quick. I've got to find it in my Bible. James chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So here we go. If you ask me for advice, is it always going to be pure? Only if it comes from here. And sometimes my mind isn't stayed on this. Wisdom from above is pure. You want pure advice? Go to God. You want advice that's peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated? Go to Jesus Christ. You want it to be full of mercy and good fruits and without partiality and without hypocrisy? Or go to the Bible. Go to Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, our fullness is in Him. Our fullness is in Him. When you're down, when you're scared, where do you look? Look to Jesus Christ. You must look to Him because we are complete in him he knows how to fix us he knows how to care for us and he knows how to keep us and i'm not saying we shouldn't rely on people god provides people for us for all sorts of things but if he's not your primary if he's not what you're desiring if he's not everything in your life you're going to have a rough go of it and so just to read those verses again just to have an opportunity just to think about it one more time before we close beware Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Let me just encourage you, have Jesus Christ as your primary, have Jesus Christ as your first, because in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead, and in him you are complete. We're going to end there. Does anyone have any comments or companion verses or anything they'd like to add? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I agreed. Agreed. Can't do that at Target. They're closed. Um, <laughs> anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I can absolutely hear you. Yeah, 
Paul says, for I'm carnal. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to make good decisions when you're draped with flesh. You know, the moment you get saved, you have spiritual discernment. But the problem is, you still have this flesh all around you. So, all right. Anyone else? All right. We'll be dismissed in prayer, and then we'll be uh, starting up service again at 11 o'clock. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for your scripture. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. For in him, we have all the things that we need in life. And I'm thankful for that title of Christian. I'm thankful to be a son of of God. I'm asking, Lord, that you would just give us discernment, help us to dwell in you, and that we would look to uh, be pleasing unto you.